So um, one more thing that connects us um, in addition to uh, our common background in Estonian literature from the University of Tartu and uh, that I supervised uh, the MA project uh, that Maris did with literary itineraries is that we come from two neighboring islands, Muhu and Saaremaa. And, uh, and I think um, one more important aspect is that uh, we both like hiking a lot. And uh, today we're going to present um, a very practical project that we did together. And um, <clears throat> first we will introduce the project and then uh, we will um, hopefully have some time to meta-reflect on what we did and uh, finally receive your comments and, uh, and uh, input and insight as well. Um, <clears throat> what we had is uh, that uh, we were contacted by Rai municipality, that is uh, an area uh, near uh, our capital city Tallinn that has been inhabited since the last uh, ice age, as soon as the ice retreated, people started to live in there. But nowadays it is um, developed into, um, uh, into a great storage and logistics and industrial area that is covered in this uh, cube shaped uh, buildings that you see on the title slide. And the municipality, uh, uh, was looking for ways to enhance the living experience of the people who live in this region because many people from the city also start to live there as newcomers uh, and create this sort of um, uh, suburbias there uh, where they have very little connection to the actual land and landscape that they inhabit. Um, then uh, the other component to our project is the app. Uh, we used the uh, Navica app, uh, which is created by our fellows Islanders. This is a simple app that can be easily managed on the admin side, and for users, it's uh, also easy to use. We have looked at uh, other similar apps, but Navica suits best for us to create such tracks. If you open the track in Zoom and hike in landscape and reach a point, your phone gives a final. And, and then uh, at a worst, worst case that uh, the, the phone would even start reading you the text uh, with the robot voice uh, that doesn't really do justice to poetry, for example, uh, but this can be turned off. Uh, then as literary scholars, uh, we thought what else would be easier to find literary creation that uh, that uh, is uh, that originates from this area and to our utter surprise we found out that there is only one single novel in Estonian that uh, has depicted the uh, landscapes from this region between three plagues by our national writer Jan Gross. Then we were also uh, lucky to find some pieces of poetry that are vaguely connected with areas around Tallinn. And uh, we also uh, were lucky to uh, engage a huge collection of place lore assembled by Marianne Remmel, a folklorist uh, who is from this area originally. And uh, this pl place lore is um, stored in Estonian folklore archives. Uh, then we did some more substantial searches in Estonian online library databases and the databases that the local libraries themselves have assembled and managed to find some more books uh, containing memoirs from the people from the region, but also uh, books uh, on local history. Then some uh, newspaper stories uh, from old digitized newspapers. And, uh, and this was pretty much our textual base that we uh, managed, to, uh, managed to assemble, but uh, pictures also form a really important place in this, uh, uh, important part of this uh, project. Uh, yes, uh, in, in the app, uh, half of the text points uh, must have a photo attached to them to uh, act activate the track. 
So we used photos from Estonian museum in, museum's information system, which was a very rich selection of photos, and also from Estonian film archives, Estonian national archives, uh, especially old maps. And uh, we also took pictures ourselves. Uh, and uh, photos help to help to create balances like uh, perception also. So it's important in this track. Yeah, especially when you see an old photograph uh, in your phone and uh, what the landscape looks like uh, uh, nowadays. It creates a really nice discrepancy in some cases. And so this is what we did. Uh, all in all, uh, we managed to uh, draw eight different trails with the different, uh, um, different, uh, different length, uh, with several uh, points of interest, points where you can listen something. And uh, most of these points uh, have a photo attached to them. Um, the amount of money that we got for it from the municipality made the business people cry in the spin-off uh, hub of University of Tartu. But uh, we got a really great experience uh, that we can now share with you. Uh, and uh, this nice gentleman that you see here uh, on this slide is uh, a man in traditional costume from this uh, parish. And uh, the legs of this man uh, where, which we borrowed as our signature picture for this uh, whole set of trails. Uh, these kind of uh, blue and red stockings are very special in their design and technology of making. They were used only in this parish and uh, in some places in Scandinavia. So, yes, uh, uh, and here you see how we did our fieldwork and how the trails show in the mobile app, mobile app and uh, in the browser. So this is the practical side and now we go to meta reflection and theory. Uh, we use Bertrand's SPAL geocriticism theory to analyze our trail text. Um, I used uh, geocriticism in my master thesis also. Uh, geocriticism main focus is on on the four elements, uh, stratigraphic vision, multifocalization, polycentrality, and intertextuality. In stratigraphic vision, it's important that uh, a topos uh, includes multiple layers of meaning, especially historical ones. Multifocalization requires many different points of view, the local view, the observer view, and the intermediate view. Polysensoriality is important to understand that not only visual landscape, but landscape sensed with all senses surrounds us. And intertextuality shows how places can be full of connection to different texts that interrelate each other. And now we, uh, we go through these uh, four aspects uh, with the help of our sample texts, uh, which we don't really uh, which we have too many to share all of them with you. But here, um, um, again, all those, uh, all those conclusions that we have and the samples may have to do with the fact that we had this sort of uh, textual corpus as we had that was dominated by folklore uh, from uh, place-based folklore and um, and therefore, uh, when, we, when we were looking uh, at how the stratigraphic vision uh, is, is brought forth in our sample texts, then uh, uh, basically uh, the, the stories about wars dominate. The Great Northern War that happened in the beginning of the 18th century, World War I, World War II, but also uh, stories uh, relating to how certain landmarks like hills or uh, ditches have been dug in the landscape or ponds uh, or how roads have been established and at which roads have there been historically and which are now. Uh, so 
Uh, and, and it must be said that uh, memoirs and memorates about wars, all sorts of wars and encounters and soldiers are very dominant in this area because the wars took place uh, around the capital and then um, all the lands uh, in the vicinity uh, fell victim to these activities that we did. Uh, and this is a picture just to show a historical map uh, from pre-Second World War, where you have the network of small roads and, uh, and a, a railway and a lot of place names. Um, and uh, you have already this uh, track for perspective new road that connects the two major cities of Estonia, Tallinn and Tartu, laid out here. But the other picture uh, shows already a different the different um, situation, uh, contemporary situation, where we have one straight road going through these uh, these areas uh, towards Tartu, and another straight road get, that that uh, is a roundabout around uh, Tallinn city. There is uh, there is the airport up here, and uh, so so it is a place for traffic at great speeds and all the little areas, little places around here have grown pretty much insignificant for a traveler's perspective. Then as to multifocalization, again, <clears throat> probably due to the fact that we have a lot of place lore and less uh, literature, uh, we found out that uh, the local view or indigenous uh, view dominates uh, all sorts of school memoirs, uh, um, anecdotal stories about particular people or events, uh, or, or like, for example, opening of new church. Uh, and uh, the observer view, uh, a glance from outside is really rare in this material only two examples, one uh, travelers uh, in the novel by Jan Gross, and then uh, a natural history depiction of uh, a nesting of redneck grip by um, an Estonian ornithologist, Erik Pumari, where he explicitly states that locals know this bird too. And uh, here's just one example, uh, an excerpt from the novel uh, Between the Three Plagues by Jan Kreuz, where the travelers uh, walk across a stream and um, they, uh, this, this protagonist, uh, Bal, Balthasar, uh, does not really have any associations uh, with what stream or what, what brook it is that he is crossing, what the place is. So, uh, as he crosses, he start, his imagination runs wild and he imagines uh, the waters underneath the bridge to be a rushing herd of sheep. Because just there is no, no um, like local association uh, for him in this, uh, in this text or in this place. Then we have the issue of color sensoriality. Um, as as um, uh, it has been stated already that, that uh, uh, it's not only visual landscapes that we experience, but uh, we experience uh, the surroundings with all of our senses. Uh, in the local lore, uh, we found mostly uh, uh, in, um, descriptions of smells and sounds. Uh, but also a little bit of tactile sensations, especially uh, associated with marshlands that uh, abound in the northern part of the parish or the local municipality. The marshlands are um, kind of weird to step on and, and uh, they're sticky. And then uh, a very peculiar set of texts uh, that we also thought it would be as considered a sensory, sensoriality, uh, a set of texts where the local people uh, tell about their supernatural experiences, supernatural encounters. Uh, for example, a place where people regularly get lost or uh, uh, a memorate about 
uh, grandma who has encountered a dancing ghost on a bridge. Uh, then uh, as, as people, um, common people have been encountering uh, a deceased landlord, uh, play stories about uh, two witches fighting over the same place where people get lost and so on and so on. So, so this is a really particular set of texts. And again, it is probably there because, uh, uh, because of the nature of the material, the folklore. Uh, but here is just one sample text uh, about tactile sensations, um, mm -hmm, uh, which um, uh, which could be experienced by uh, by people, uh, young children in these areas. Um, it felt fine to cover ourselves up with mud from head to toe because there happened to be fine muddy streaks in the close vicinity and the place where the uh, where this. Um, narrator stayed as a child. Uh, then uh, intertextuality is probably the most tricky uh, part here because uh, it's, it occurs not only between texts but also between texts and uh, in the form of other intersemiotic connections. Uh, textual, uh, for example, uh, two texts feature the same uh, wolf spells, how to reject wolves when they attack you. Uh, then um, uh, stories about uh, Lehmia Ukru, uh, where um, when we go back uh, all the way, uh, the coat of arms of the local municipality has two oak uh, leaves, uh, as, as this Lehmia Ukru um, is one of the major, um, one of the major uh, places uh, of interest in this area. Uh, and now this is, uh, I will leave on this picture uh, for the intertextuality. This is uh, Vaskiala Bridge, and there is a story called The Maiden of Vaskiala Bridge that was written down uh, by our national uh, uh, author, our national epic, Friedrich Reinhold Kreuzwald, uh, at the end of uh, 1860s. Uh, this is a really fine story about uh, Moon kidnapping a fine young lady from this particular location. And uh, this is how this place looks now. And uh, this is how it looked in uh, 1860s, depicted by a local artist who was uh, originally from a, a water mill in, uh, located here where the, where the photograph take, uh, was taken. And, um, also, um, also, it was quite uh, funny that we found um, a poem by a local girl using the same motive of a girl longing to go to the moon uh, that was featured in this, uh, in this uh, story. Um, and, and the author herself was not aware that her poem was intertextual. But now uh, to the conclusion remarks, because we have one minute left, <laughs> is that um, in practice, these four geopolitical aspects uh, tend to overlap. Uh, they are not clear categories. One text features many of them. Uh, then a practical consideration, uh, assembling and placing these uh, stories to the app and to the landscape uh, took a lot more time than we expected, but it was uh, also a lot of fun. Uh, pandemic time offered a really good launching window for this application. People uh, have uh, really um, started to use it and we get five star ratings, uh, but uh, uh, we also try to assemble some um, some verbal um, feedback for the presentation, which we didn't manage to get, but we hope to get it next week. Uh, and, uh, and then the two questions uh, to muse about uh, are that we made the effort, but does it really make the people feel the historical depth of the landscape that they happen to inhabit? Because nowadays they look like they have no history whatsoever. And another question, would that app help to make people slow down for a short while in their lives? 
something like this. You have this highway underneath and then someone biking slowly over it to the actual landscapes outside the highway. But this is a rare perspective. Thanks. Thank you.